In the last episode, I walked you through the basics of a Minecraft computer. Uh, basic design with registers, program memory, and an ALU. And while this design is Turing complete and meets the basic requirements for a Minecraft computer, there is still so much more that we can do with this system. So in this episode, I'm going to start adding features to this computer to help improve its efficiency and increase its power. Keep in mind though, although we are starting to scratch the surface on some new concepts never before seen by uh, most Minecraft computer enthusiasts, this episode will primarily be focusing on additions that have been covered by other computer enthusiasts before, mainly the computer's ability to bring data in, store it, and send data out through the use of RAM and I.O. As we saw in the last episode, uh, a computer is really nothing more than an automatic calculator that can manipulate its data based on a program, and then manipulate its program based on its data through the use of branching. Uh, but most programs typically require arguments, or initial pieces of data, that the computer can run through its program to create an answer. In our multiplication program from the last episode, our arguments were the multiplicand and multiplier, which were initially stored uh, in the first and second register off-camera before the program was executed. Now, although this works, there are easier ways of introducing data into a computer. Now, SwiftX16 and many people like him will oftentimes give the uh, the user a bus that they can use to enter data manually and uh, some buttons that they can use to enter the data on the bus into the working registers. Before the program starts, the user can enter their initial data into the registers using this interface uh, and then start the program. The problem with this setup is, what if the program has more than two arguments? Uh, an easy solution is to just add more registers to write to, but unless you intend on making an infinite number of registers, there will always be a program whose arguments exceed the computer's number of registers. One solution is to just let the computer take care of its own arguments, and in case you didn't catch it yet, the whole series so far is just showing you how a computer can do something for you that you've probably already been doing. Now there are many ways that a computer can take care of its own arguments. One method is through the use of immediate data. This is just numbers stored in program memory that the program can introduce into the computer at any time. Think of it like the program just giving the computer a number instead of telling the computer to fetch a number from a register. Hooking this up is simply a case of connecting a bus between the program memory and the bus in the computer. So, what I've done to accommodate for this issue is I've basically built another bus coming out of program memory, similar to the immediate address bus coming out of program memory running to the program counter, that runs immediately into the uh, computer's internal bus. This allows us to inject immediate values from the program memory directly into the computer uh, as if we were loading them ourselves. Now because the immediate data is part of program memory, it is read-only, meaning that the program can't manipulate it whilst it's in the program memory. This effectively makes the data stored in program memory constant data. Uh, however, you can still move the data into the registers and manipulate it from there. Uh, with this, you can easily allocate a few lines at the beginning of your program uh, to set up the registers with the initial data and then use the rest of your program to manipulate that data. So now, the task of setting up the registers, which we would normally do before the program executes, is taken care of by the program itself. What's more, you may have noticed that I'm sending the data in through the bus that is used to send the data from the registers to the ALU, instead of sending it directly into the registers. The reason for this is because by taking this path, we actually travel past the registers and actually go through the ALU before going to the registers. This seemingly insignificant design decision uh, actually allows us to do something that most Minecraft computers can't do. We can actually, with this setup, operate with immediate data. So if we have a constant that we want to use in an operation over and over again, say we want to add a multiplicand to a register X amount of times, instead of storing that constant in a register and using up that register, uh, we can simply store it in program memory and introduce it anytime we want. Uh, effectively reducing the number of registers we need to use during execution. You may have also noticed that with this setup we now have 22 data lines coming from program memory. Uh, 16 are going to the computer itself and 6 are going to the program counter. We can reduce this down to 16 by combining the lower 6 bits of the 16-bit data bus 
with the program counters data bus or you can do what I'm doing here and just move the program counter into the computer. Doing either achieves the same results but doing it this way opens up a few options for us later on. I'm also moving the flag register here too. Uh, this will also serve a purpose later on but for now it's just to tidy things up a bit. So it's understandable if what I've just done may have confused a few of you here. So just a real quick recap, we'll go ahead and cover what we just uh, covered in the past few minutes here. So what I've done off camera here is I've basically just moved the decoder for the program memory over and then bust it to the new location of the program counter register. And so of course the, the program counter and the flag register are still hooked together in the same manner uh, it's just now that they're right next to each other, the line isn't nearly as long, so there's a little less of a delay there. Anyway, conditional jumping works the exact same way as it did before. We still have the lines back here, which allow us to select a flag and choose to negate it. The condition result is then sent to the program counter, where it's used to decide whether or not we are jumping or whether we're simply incrementing. And then the jump to address can still be introduced into the program counter. Uh, it's just it has to take a little bit of a different path. So instead of giving it its own dedicated bus, uh, we now use the immediate data bus and we simply use the lower five bits of the 16-bit bus. We send that into the computer through the ALU and of course because it's going through the ALU we will have to uh, enable an exclusive OR or an OR output in order to get that result. Uh, so we send it through the ALU. The ALU then spits it out onto the result bus where it can then travel down to this side where it can pass through the uh, zero flag gate and into the program counter. Function wise we haven't changed this computer much at all uh, but what we have done is we've introduced the immediate bus which allows us to bring data directly from program memory and put it directly into the computer and we'll go ahead and demonstrate this here with a sample program. So the sample program I've decided to write up for this computer is a, another version of the multiplication program that I wrote in the last episode, which multiplies uh, 14 by 28. Now, so that we can actually see what's going on in the computer whilst it's operating, I've got a small command block contraption hooked up here, which just uh, clocks the computer every time I drop an item, and this way uh, we can watch it do its thing at our speed without having to fly back here and clock it every single time. So just small command block contraption, nothing functional just to clock it. So the first line in our program simply resets the uh, eighth register which is what we are using as an accumulator for our product as well as sort of the output for our product. So this just makes sure that zero is loaded into the eighth register and of course that's easy to do we simply write to the eighth register without doing anything else and by default a zero will be loaded into the eighth register so again we have our lamps that's hook, hooked up to the eighth register and if I go ahead and drop an item we should see the eighth register get cleared out this next line is our first example of the load immediate instruction uh, which again takes an immediate value from program memory and loads it into one of the registers. So what we of course do is we um, tell the program to write to the first register which is where we are going to be storing our multiplier and then we simply load our multiplier which is 14 into the immediate bus. Now again this value is passing through the ALU to get to the register so in order to make sure it can actually get through we also enable the exclusive or output on the ALU. This allows the 14 to pass through the ALU unaltered and go into the result bus where we can then store it in the first register. So if I were to go ahead and fly over there, we can go ahead and drop an item and we should see 14 loaded into the register. The next instruction is our first example of an operate on immediate value instruction. So similar to the last program, what we are going to do is basically take uh, 28 and add it to the product over and over and over again. But instead of storing 28 in one of the registers, we're simply going to operate on an immediate value. So what we do is we read from the 8th register on the B bus. Now it's important that uh, we send the 8th register to the B bus because the immediate value always goes to the A bus.
So we send the immediate value on the A bus, and we send the eighth register on the B bus, and both values go into the ALU, where we enable the sum output. So the sum of both these values will go into the result bus, where we then store it in the eighth register. What this effectively means is we're taking whatever's in the eighth register and adding 28 to it. So since there's nothing in this register this time around, if we go ahead and clock it, we should see effectively 28 loaded into the register. The next two lines do exactly what they did in the last rendition of the program. Uh, this next line decrements the first register, so the 14 then decrements to 13. Uh, and then it clocks the flag register so that it can record the results of that operation. And then the next line simply jumps back if the results, or if the zero flag is off. Um, the only difference, of course, is we're not jumping to line zero in this case, we're jumping to line two. Uh, because line 0 and 1 are our setup lines, and line 2 is the start of our loop. So if we go ahead and clock our computer, you'll see that the 14 in the first register gets turned into 13. And then the computer will decide if it should continue on in a linear path, or if it should jump to line 2, depending on our condition. Since our condition is looking at the 0 flag and checking to see if it's off, which it is, the computer will jump to line 2 when we clock it. And of course, line 2 is our operate immediate instruction, which takes the value stored in register 8 and adds 28 to it. So if we go ahead and clock our computer again, we should see the 28 get doubled to 56. And of course, just like in the last rendition of the program, this will continue on until the first register uh, contains a zero, at which point the condition will fail and the program will continue off into whatever instructions we have following these set of instructions. So by the end of this we should expect the answer that we had the previous time to show up in the eighth register. So now we have a system that can manipulate data that it gives itself according to a program. Easy. Until you give it more data than it can handle. So now the question is what do you do when that happens? You could give it more registers and just hope no one ever writes a program that requires more, but these particular registers are really bulky. You really don't want to use too many of these things in your computer. Another option is to use something called random access memory, or RAM. We use RAM because it's usually more dense than registers, uh, which means we can store more data in smaller spaces. The only drawback is it's usually slower to access than the registers. In real computers, this is due to latency. But in Minecraft computers, it's due to bandwidth. See, with the dual read memory we're using as registers, we can send two pieces of data at the same time into the ALU. But with single read memory we're using for our RAM, we can only send one piece of data at a time, effectively halving our bandwidth. Even though this seems like a pretty big drawback, we use RAM regardless because it's easier to add more RAM to suit our needs than it is to add more registers. Connecting our RAM to our computer is fairly straightforward. We simply connect the input of our RAM, which is on the top, to the top bus of the computer, and the output of our RAM, which is on the bottom, to the bottom bus of our computer. This particular configuration is fairly useful because it forces all incoming data through the ALU before it can go to the registers. This means that we can perform operations on data coming directly from RAM. But it also means that the data coming out of the registers has to pass through the ALU before going to the RAM, which means we can also perform operations on data before it gets stored to RAM. In fact, we don't even have to use a register at all. As long as our operation is a one operand operation, we can simply take the data from the RAM, send it in through the bottom bus, through the ALU, and straight back out to RAM. Of course, that's not to say we can't do two operand operations. You may have noticed that the RAM and the immediate value bus go to the ALU on two separate buses. This effectively allows us to perform an operation on a value in RAM, with the second operand being an immediate value. So you can, in fact, perform two operand operations with values in RAM, as long as one of the operands is a constant. Similar to the general purpose registers, we can use a decoder to select a location in RAM and allow us to specifically write to or read from that location. 
Of course, also like the general purpose registers, we need an address to, uh, to select a location. We could easily get this address by making another bus in the program memory, but it's a lot easier to just use the one we already have in place. So if we tap a few lines from our media data in bus and send it directly to the decoder, we now have an address, which means our work is done. Well, almost anyway. Before I mention what else is missing, I would like to take a moment to point out that I went ahead and threw a bunch of AND gates on the bus here. Now there's a very specific reason that will become clear later on, but essentially what I've done is I've taken the, the bus coming in and I've put an AND gate between the input and the bus going to the B input of the ALU, and that is controlled by this input here. If we turn it on, the data is allowed through. And then we, I've also taken an output and ANDed it to the bus going to the address to RAM. So if we turn this off, or if, sorry, if we turn this on, the data is allowed through into the address bus. Again, this may not seem like it makes a whole lot of sense, but it will become clear why I did this later on. So the reason why this still doesn't quite work is, even though we've got a decoder like the general purpose registers, unlike the general purpose registers, we still don't have an enable line for it, or in this case, a read and write line. If we actually go over here, we can see our write line is just kind of floating here, as is our read line. To overcome this, we can simply add two lines to our program memory here one to act as the RAM read line, and the other act to act as the RAM write line. We can then take those two lines and run them over to the read and write line on the RAM to allow us to control the RAM using the program memory. Whilst we're adding lines to program memory, I went ahead and added some lines from program memory to the two enable lines that I installed earlier on the immediate data in bus. Since I did that, now would probably be a good time to explain why I put this here. As we know, the immediate data bus is this 16-bit bus that goes directly into the CPU. But, since we made this modification here, it also acts as the address for RAM. Well, the problem is, if we're sending an address to RAM from this bus, it's also going to go into the computer, which means if we're actually receiving data from RAM to go into the computer and we're using another register as a second operand, it will actually use the second register and whatever we have put on this bus together. And that can actually cause some data corruption. So we put this enable line here to prevent data from going into the computer when we simply want to use it as an address. However, I also have this enable line here that keeps the data from going into the address bus. You might think this is a little bit redundant, but for what we're about to do later on in this video, it's actually kind of necessary. So stick around and I will explain to you why I did this later on. So with this setup alone, we can, on top of what we could already do, introduce immediate data into the computer and store extra data in external storage addressed, of course, by our immediate data bus. But if you were paying attention earlier, you may have noticed that I mentioned a new function that this computer can't actually do yet. I mentioned earlier that this computer can actually perform an operation between RAM and a constant value put on the immediate bus. But it can't actually do that just yet. And the reason why we can't do that is because if we're using the immediate bus to introduce the second operand, where is the address for RAM coming from? Again, we could just add another bus to take care of this, and this would take care of this entire situation, but there is another way of doing this that actually opens up another option for us. I'm tapping the back of the eighth register here, effectively turning our dual read memory into triple read memory. I'm then going to take the output of this third output, along with our immediate data bus slash address bus, and I'm going to connect them to an adder, this adder's output will then be our new address bus. What this allows us to do is use the eighth register as something called a pointer register. Much like how the immediate data can be sent to the address bus to point to a location in RAM, we can also send information in a register to the address bus to point to a location in RAM, according to the data stored in the register. Pointing to RAM using the immediate data is referred to as direct addressing, while pointing to RAM using a register is referred to as indirect addressing. 
With the example that I proposed before, which was adding a value from RAM to a constant value on the bus, the question was, how do we address the RAM if we're using the immediate data bus to inject our immediate value? The answer is in the circuit that I just built right here. See, with this setup, we can now store an address in the eighth register and use that register to indirectly address the RAM, which means if we wanted to perform an operation with an immediate value, we first load our address into the eighth register, then use the eighth register to point to RAM, which would then bring in its value, which we could operate on with our immediate value. However, this circuit's usefulness does not stop there. We can also use algorithms to calculate an address and place it in our pointer register, allowing software to determine what part of memory is going to be read from and written to. This is especially useful in arrays, but that's a topic for a future video. You may have also noticed that I use an adder to combine the two address buses together instead of a multiplexer. The reason for this is now we have the ability to add the two addresses together, creating something known as a constant plus offset addressing mode. This is useful for many things, but most of these topics are more advanced, so for that reason, I'm going to be leaving them for another video. But for now, just know that this option is here. Before I continue, I do feel that there are two things that I probably should mention, uh, just to clear some confusion here. So when it comes to the addressing of the registers, it is fairly similar to the way we address the registers uh, in the CPU itself. However, instead of having a rising or falling edge detector on each write line, what we're doing is we're actually feeding the um, enable line directly into the write line and then disabling it with a master edge detector. The reason why we do this is because there is the chance, especially with the adder in the circuit, that the address can change before we're ready to write. Now if that happens, then what will end up happening is you'll end up writing to whatever address location ends up having its write line go down and then back up. So to solve this, uh, we basically take the edge detection out of it completely and connect it to a separate enable line just like this. So essentially what we're doing is we're updating the entire RAM module on the falling edge of the write line. Now this is a problem because we do need a falling edge in order to actually trigger a write. But this is not something that we will get if, say, we're writing to RAM twice in a row in one instruction after the other. Because the torches preceding each other will never turn off long enough to trigger a falling edge. So to solve this, we put another enable line on the output of the decoder going into the program memory. And what this does is it allows the signals from the decoder to travel into the program memory so long as this circuit is off. Now this circuit is turned on directly by the clock, so every time the PC register receives a clock pulse, it also sends a clock pulse to this circuit, which charges the comparator circuit here and through the use of a redstone torch disables the signals going out uh, and then as the comparators discharge after a brief moment it will then enable the signals again so what essentially happens is we're basically putting a delay on the switch from one line to another so instead of this line immediately turning on and this line immediately turning off what will happen is this line will turn on and then after a brief moment this line will turn off and this will allow us to inject just a small off pulse between uh, instructions just long enough to trigger any falling edge circuits that need it. So to demonstrate some of the new addressing abilities that this computer now has with its RAM I went ahead and rewrote the multiplication program to kind of incorporate these new techniques so naturally we of course need to set up the computer to run a multiplication program and for that we have the first line which loads register 1 with the multiplier. Now our multiplier is still 14 but you may have noticed that I'm actually loading the 2's complement of that into register 1. Uh, the reason for this will become apparent later on. Our next instruction then takes register 1 and loads it into memory at address 0. The next instruction then overwrites the content in register 1 with data 0. And finally, we move once again what's in register 1 to RAM at address 1. 
The final instruction in our setup loads register 8 with our pointer, which points to address 1 in RAM. So, now that our setup portion is complete, it is now time to begin the multiplication portion of the multiplication program. Now, with our multiplicand and multiplier both being stored in RAM, uh, we're going to be doing the same thing as the previous revisions, which is taking the multiplier register and adding a constant to it over and over again according to a multiplicand. Uh, we need to address RAM to pull our multiplicand out, uh, but if we are sending a constant value from program memory to be added to the multiplicand, our address has to come from somewhere else, and that is why we loaded register 8 with the address 1. With this particular instruction, what we are able to do is send the number in register 8 to the address bus, which is loaded with 1, and we can then use that number to address RAM. With that, we can then read from RAM, and because we are addressing 1, it will read from location 1, and send its value out onto the bus. Now, at this point, it currently is stored with nothing, but it will soon be stored with something else. So we send the data in register or address location 1 onto the bus, and that bus goes directly into the ALU. Now, on top of that, the immediate constant value from program memory is also going to the ALU on the other bus. And so in the same instruction, we've set it up so that the data on both the buses get added together. So because we are adding the constant 28 to the value in RAM 0, the result is effectively just going to be 28. Not that interesting at the moment, but later on it gets to be a little bit more eh, fun. Now because we're adding a value from RAM to a constant and not actually using any of the registers, we can in fact save this value that we've pulled from RAM right back into RAM as if it was one of the general purpose registers. So that's exactly what we're doing. You'll notice we have both the read and write lines on, which means we're currently reading from RAM and we will write to RAM as well. Uh, so since we are currently reading from address 1, uh, we will on the next cycle write to address 1 whatever we have stored on the bus, which is of course whatever is in address 1 plus 28. And because we have 0, that's just 28. The next instruction does the exact same thing as the previous instruction, but this time we're actually performing a single operand instruction on a uh, piece of data located in RAM, which means we actually have our immediate bus freed up for the address, which is why we don't have to initiate register 8 with a pointer pointing to 0. So we load our pointer 0 into the address bus, we then send it to RAM, and in return, RAM returns whatever is at address 0, which happens to be our negative 14. Now, that negative 14 can then be sent to the ALU, where we can perform our single operand operation on it, and then send back the result on the return bus to go into RAM. Now, because this is our multiplier that we're talking about here, we do want to keep track of when this multiplier's equation equates to 0. So, for that reason, we clock the flag register to keep track of the 0 flag, uh, at the same time that we write the result back into RAM. Now, as you recall, I loaded RAM with negative 14 instead of positive 14. So you might be asking, why didn't I load it with positive 14 and then decrement the value? The reason being is, even though this ALU design does have a decrement function, it currently can't use it because as we stand, and as the computer is wired up, the values coming from RAM are currently going into the B bus of the ALU. Now, in order to decrement, values must be coming in on the A bus. Kind of a design flaw, but we're going to roll with it nonetheless, because this particular setup opens up more options than it shuts off. But what this means is, so long as the data is coming in on the B bus, we can't actually decrement it, so we have to increment it. So, for that reason, I've loaded the register with negative 14 instead of positive 14, uh, which we can then increment to get to zero. And of course, once it's at zero, the zero flag will then turn on, and that will trip our conditional jump. At this point, we all kind of know the rest of the multiplication program, so there's really no need to go into details. But this was basically just a means of demonstrating 
uh, indirect and direct addressing, as well as operands involving RAM. So now we have a means of letting the software introduce data into the computer for us, as well as a way of storing massive amounts of data and different methods of addressing that data. But we still don't have a way of letting the user interact with the computer. Meaning at this point, the user can't give the computer any real-time input, nor can the computer properly share its output with the user. So to accomplish this, we're going to use something called an input-output device, or I.O. device for short. Now, you may have seen I.O. devices before on other Minecraft computers. Uh, anything from button panels, to number displays, to D-pads, and even dot matrix screens. All of these fall under the category of an I.O. device. The only differences between other I.O. devices and the ones we're going to be adding is the way we control them. See, the way most Minecraft computers control I.O. devices is they'll have a line in program memory specifically designed to read from or write to that specific I.O. device. This works if you only have a few I.O. devices on your computer, but it can start to get a little bit cumbersome after a certain point. So, what we'll be doing instead is implementing a technique that Intel itself uses on all their CPUs called Mapped I.O. The way Mapped I.O. works is fairly similar to the way Mapped Memory works. An address is generated in the CPU and then sent to the I.O. devices, similar to RAM. Then a read and write signal can be generated to read from or write to the selected I.O. device, similar to the way we read from or write to an address in RAM. Since it works the same way, we can simply hook up the I.O. devices to our external bus as if it was more RAM, and then use the address bus and either an immediate address or the pointer register to select an I.O. device as if it were just another location in RAM. Connecting the I.O. in this fashion is referred to as memory mapped I.O., and while this certainly works, you do have to be mindful as to what address you sign each I.O. device. Uh, for example, this particular bank here is occupying addresses 0 through 31. So if I were to add an I.O. device to this RAM block, I would need to add it to an address greater than 31. This way, you can assure that any I.O. device you add doesn't take an address that is already taken by RAM. Of course, an easy way around this, though, is to simply give all I.O. devices their own memory space. And that's exactly what we will be doing. By adding another line to the program memory, and another output next to the read and write lines, we can make another control line called I.O. memory, or I.O. mem for short. With this line off, we can address RAM as we normally would, but with this line on, we suddenly start addressing I.O. devices instead. This is referred to as port mapped I.O., and is typically what Intel will do on their CPUs for security reasons. Uh, this means that we can assign addresses to ports independently of the RAM. We just have to make sure to add an enable line on all I.O. devices to keep them inactive when I.O. mem is off. Likewise, RAM will need a disable line to keep it inactive when I.O. mem is on. As far as connecting an I.O. device to our computer is concerned, it's fairly similar to hooking up RAM. You'll notice that both RAM and I.O. devices have similar control lines that is, of course, being a read and write pin, as well as an enable. So, of course, when it comes to RAM, we can read from or write to the device, but only if that device is enabled first. Once the device is enabled, we can then write or read, and it'll work just fine. And then, of course, when we disable the device, we can no longer do that. Similar with an I.O. device, we can read from and write to the I.O. devices, but only if the enable line is on. And, of course, when it is off, we can no longer perform such actions. Now, typically, the enabling is done with the use of the address bus. With an address being sent out, we can use that to enable a certain location in RAM or a certain I.O. device. But now that we have the I.O. mem line, we need to create a function that enables it when the I.O. mem line is at a certain state and a certain address is selected. We're not going to deal with the address because, frankly, it's another layer of abstraction and we can understand how it works without explaining it. But what I will explain is how the I.O. mem line works with all this.
So for all intents and purposes, let's just for now pretend that we have RAM with only one address location and only one I.O. device. Obviously, if you'd have multiple locations and multiple devices, you would need an address bus to address between the two. Uh, but for now, as long as we have one, we can simply use the I.O. mem line to distinguish between RAM and I.O. To make things easier for us, rather than having separate read and write lines for I.O. and memory, we can actually tie the two read and write lines together, creating one set of read and write lines that gets distributed to both RAM and I.O. As for the enable lines, well, they also get tied together as well, and they get tied to the I.O. mem line. The only difference is, rather than both being tied together so that when the line is on, both turn on, one side is inverted so that when the line is off, one is enabled, and when the line is on, the other is enabled. This line now allows us to select between RAM and I.O. using only one line. From there, we can then decide whether we're going to write to or read from that device or RAM location by simply turning on the appropriate line. With this setup, you'll notice that even though both RAM and I.O. have their write lines enabled, only I.O. will actually be written to because it's the only one with its enable line active. Of course, adding multiple I.O. devices is similar to adding multiple addresses in RAM. In order to address each one, we have to add a decoder that will enable certain I.O. devices or RAM locations when a certain combination is put into the decoder. Uh, and of course, only when that particular I.O. device or RAM location is selected and the enable is on, will that particular device or RAM location be accessible to the computer. For example, if we go ahead and send a 2 into the decoder and the second line of the decoder is on, with the I.O. mem line set to high, that enables the I.O. devices and the decoder selecting the second device. When we hit read or write, the only device that will actually be read from or written to will be the second I.O. device. And with that said, I think it's time to move to an actual example that we can hook up to our computer. So, pardon the horrible wiring that we've got going on under here. I will be doing some work after the episode is done to try and tidy up everything here. But these are the simplest forms of I.O. devices that you will find on just about any computer. And these are basically just user interfaces. So on the bottom here we have a, an I.O. device input that allows the user to input a number. And on the top here we have a I.O. output which allows the computer to output a number that the user can see. Uh, this essentially is basically a memory location that the user can modify. Now I have this particular I.O. device hooked up to address 0, uh, which still leaves with our 8-bit bus 255 I.O. device locations that we can still use. And of course, to actually demonstrate these I.O. devices, I actually have a small program written up that utilizes them, if you'll allow me to show you. This small program that I wrote isn't too terribly lengthy. In fact, it's not even that complicated. All it does is it reads from I.O. device 0, which is this I.O. device, whatever is at the lower portion here, saves it to register 0, then brings it back out and writes it back to the same I.O. device so it appears on the top set of lights here. Then there's one more command that jumps back to zero and the whole cycle repeats. So even though this does it really, really slowly, anything that you enter in the lower input panel here will, after some time, show up at the top panel up there. Now, as I mentioned, this particular computer design with its 8-bit address bus can have up to 256 I.O. devices, but I can't be saying that I'm going to be having 256 ports that the user can interact with, so why would I need so many ports? As I said before, user input and output devices aren't the only things that can be used as I.O. devices. You can, in fact, use a plethora of different devices as an I.O. device. One example, of course, being the digit display that is used on most computers nowadays, uh, as well as the pixel display that's used on Red Game and the Commodore 32 computer by Lawrence Wayne. In fact, I.O. devices don't even have to be user inputs or displays at all. They can perform 
calculations that the computer otherwise would be unable to or too slow to do. For example, in my Skittlebits CPU, I actually had the address calculation and interrupt vector calculator as separate I.O. devices from the computer itself. This meant that when I needed to calculate an interrupt vector or a, an address, I could actually have the computer assign these functions to these I.O. devices and force them to do the heavy lifting rather than having the CPU do all the work. A real-life example of something like this would be a graphics card. See, when it comes to actually calculating images for the screen, especially in something as graphically intensive as a video game, it's too much work for the CPU, and if you relied solely on the CPU to do this stuff, you would experience some very heavy lag, which is why most gaming computers will come with a GPU, which will take on the task of calculating large images, and sometimes even physics-related stuff, so that the CPU can be left to do other game-related things. My point is, an I.O. device doesn't necessarily have to be a device that the user uses to interact with the computer. It can also be an external device that takes on heavy calculation tasks that the CPU would otherwise be unable to do, such as an external multiplier or square root calculator. And if you really want to be fancy, you can even connect another CPU up to the main CPU as an I.O. device, creating sort of a master-slave configuration. Basically, the main CPU dictates what the other CPU initially does in its program. It's a little complex and not really what we're studying right now, so I won't go into too much detail, but before you get ahead of yourself, no, this is not how multitasking is done. That, too, is also something we'll be discussing later on. Now, as far as memory and I.O. device-related topics are concerned, I really only have one more subject to cover, but unfortunately, this next topic is such a huge topic and contains so much information that I'll have to make it its own video by itself. So for now, I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you liked it, be sure to leave a like, and be sure to leave any questions you may have in the comments. I'll be more than happy to answer them. Be sure to subscribe if you want to be notified on when the next episode is released, and be sure to follow me on Twitter if you'd like updates on when I'm working on episodes like these, or other videos. For those of you wondering, I will also be posting a world with this computer in it for you guys to play with in each episode, and of course it will be updated with each episode so you can play with the most recent computer that I've worked on. That said, be sure to join me in the next episode where we will be giving this computer stack capabilities and explore all the things that we can do with the stack. Be sure to join me then, and I'll see you there.